Well, hello and welcome to my garden. Actually, welcome to the last in a series of detailed garden tour videos that I've been doing here in my uh, Zone 5 Southeastern Wisconsin garden. Now, I've been filming these tours over the last more than a month, actually. So some of these gardens were hitting at their peak and some, like one of them that I'm going to show you today, I should have filmed a little bit earlier. And I filmed these two tours at two different times of day because they both sort of shine at different times of day. So let's start with what I call unimaginatively the driveway garden. And this is the sunny part of the garden that is right off the road. And it's the very first thing you see when you come into our driveway. Before I get into the tour, make sure to subscribe if you haven't already and if you like this video. So I've been waiting to film this one during sort of golden hour because this end of the garden is so pretty at this time. So we're going to start over here. We've seen the Pignathema muticum in the last shade video and so the shade path that we saw sort of goes behind here and now I'm going to pick up from there. So uh, this is an Artemisia that's a sample plant for this year. This came from Walters Gardens and this is silver lining. It's supposed to be an Artemi Artemisia, Artemisia, however you say that, uh, that doesn't spread like other ones. Um, I'm all for that. I don't generally grow Artemisia because of their spreading nature. This one is really quite pretty and uh, we'll see how it does over winter, but uh, so far I quite like it. Right here, you can see this sort of cloud. This is bronze fennel. It reseeds in this spot every year. You do have to watch with bronze fennel and really any of these umbellifer type plants because they seed a lot. So you just have to, you know, grub it out where you don't want it. Um, these flowers are mostly spent, but they really are absolutely beautiful. Tucked behind here is a blue shag white pine that I think is quite chlorotic and um, needs some more acidity. So I have a feeling that if I don't do something to correct those issues, it may not be here for long. It should get quite large, six feet wide probably. So as we come around the corner here, first of all, this is an orange cosmos that I grew from seed and planted here. And then we've got tassel flower mixed throughout here. Uh, just the most charming little annual uh, grown from seed and it should reseed in this area. And then down here we've got, uh, this is Cat's Pajamas Nepeta, sort of probably on its second or third bloom. I, I can't say enough about that Nepeta for the front of a border. The very large shrub slash tree that you see here is Cornus Moss. This is Cornelian Cherry Dogwood. This was planted in 2020 and holy cow did it go through a growth spurt this year. It's getting huge. Now the thing with these cornice mosses is that they grow up before they grow out. Generally speaking they are a tree that is wider than they are tall and I think we're starting to see some of that here. Every year I go through and I do sort of limit up a little bit from the bottom because I do want it to be more of a tree than a shrub um, and I will need to go in there and do that again. Along this edge here we've got more of the Cecilaria autumnalis. You've been seeing this in several areas of my garden and you've been seeing it at the best time of year because why would you want anything other than this grass with those beautiful flowers? A little bit of Stachys humulo in there too. Stach the Stachys humulo is such a good transition plant because it handles everything from sun to part shade quite well. As we move along here, you're going to see that one of the things that I changed this year was that I put some dahlias in here, which I haven't normally done, but I put one of the most prolific and easiest care dahlias that I grow in here, and that is um, HS Date. And the only problem with it is that I need to get out here more often to deadheaded but it's still absolutely gorgeous and I think the orange color through you'll see throughout here the orange color is really a great addition to this garden. So this tall plant that you see here is Veronica Castrum Queen of Diamonds 
And I have experimented with cutting this tree. There is a squirrel up there knocking down acorns like nobody's business. Uh, with cutting this back by half, sort of a Chelsea Chop style thing, it doesn't get much taller than that, but I realized I would like the height. And it's got nice stiff stems, so you don't have to worry about it falling over or anything. The flowers are beautiful and um, the bees absolutely love it. In fact, here's one now. There is a phlox tucked in there. I don't know which one that is. So in one of the other garden tours, I showed you a uh, um, Echinops, a blue globe thistle. Well, this is the white version of that. I think this is called white frost. And you can see the difference between a flower that's still blooming and one that's done blooming. This one st is still quite white. This one goes kind of gray. But you can do the same thing with this one that I showed you with the blue globe thistle, which is just wipe off those dead petals. And what you're left with is really quite an attractive thing. Now I have staked this because it did start to get a little floppy on me. I'm fine with that situation. This is a, a plant. It looks like a shrub. It is five feet tall that I wanted to make sure to show you. It's, it's actually a perennial. This is a eupatorium. This is a bone set type of eupatorium. And I'm going to put the name on the screen because I can't remember the cult of our name right now. It was bred by Brent Horvath in Illinois. And what you see right now is just kind of these sort of nondescript white flowers, which are attracting. I see a honeybee and a bumblebee on there right now. But this is the biggest butterfly attractor in my yard by a mile. In about two weeks when the monarchs start coming through, I have one here and then there's one um right there to across the creek here uh, between the two plants there might be 50 monarchs on at one time you have never seen anything like it it's absolutely amazing now i want to back up so i can show you this garden from afar because that is how it is typically viewed and i've made some changes to this garden this year and i am really happy with how it has come together so the first thing i did was i added some agastache blue fortune in the background so we have one here we have a few more there which offers a great amount of structure and listen i'm a sucker for blue flowers let's just let's just admit that right up front and i think they look great there we have some um, little blue stem through here this is probably jazz or standing ovation and uh, those have not bulked up a ton but, uh, but they certainly have that blue color and I think they're getting there. There's a Baptisia here, which of course is finished blooming. That blooms very early in the year. But the foliage, I think, looks absolutely fabulous in here. Now maybe the biggest difference maker in this garden this year is that I've added in these sedums. This sedum is called Carl. It's a much brighter sedum and earlier to color up than other sedums like for perhaps Autumn Joy that you are probably familiar with. And I think this bright color in here is, is really great. But of course, it wouldn't look nearly as great if it weren't for the fact that I've got this purple love grass growing behind it, which is now coming into bloom. Purple love grass looks like a hot mess until it blooms. And then it just turns into the most gorgeous cloud of purple you've ever seen and uh, that is why last year i told myself i am going to plant more of that so i did there is a nepa here in front i think this is called persian blue possibly it was a sample plant that i got several years ago it does fairly well here um, keep in mind this area is prone to you know dogs walking by and peeing on things so that does happen I also have a sanguisorba blooming through here. So I think that is a, just a fabulous little uh, addition here. Now, uh, this grass, which you can barely see here, this is um, uh, Blonde Ambition. And is what I planted in this garden, this whole garden originally. It didn't do very well, which is such a shame because it's such an absolutely stunner of a grass. I also have some great blue lobelia in there. So that's the blue that you see through there and some Amsonia. So we've got some more of that uh, Echinops here. More, essentially this is a repetition of 
um, what was already here. The other plant that I added, and there are more of them throughout here, but you can see this one the best, is Parthenium. This is wild quinine. And uh, they're just getting started, newly planted this year. But such an interesting, fun flower. Now, believe it or not, I have a poppy blooming down there. That is completely inexplicable. But let's take a moment to take a peek at it here. It is blooming with some more of those orange cosmos. And uh, that is the nicest little surprise. So this garden got a big dose of color this year, thanks to the dahlias and the sedums, um, which it really needed. And that, and that agastache, that was a big, big help too. And I'm very, very happy with, with how it's looking now. And I think it's the perfect sort of color for a garden that is mostly appreciated when walking by or driving by. So now we come to the other half of this garden, which is on the other half of the creek here. And of course you would be able, there's the bridge that we walk through to get to the other side of the garden. So you'd be able to get here that way too. So of course we've got some Asclepes tuberosa here. Um, you know, I mean, who doesn't love this milkweed? It's just such a, just such a beauty. I find that it takes a little bit to get going, but once it does, it, it's pretty great. I did add in some new flocks this year. Um, they are throughout here, but this might be one of the only ones that's blooming. Uh, they were brand new not too long ago. Now this is a deadheaded um, Shasta daisy. It was really pretty when it bloomed, but you know Shasta daisies. Uh, I've not been successful in getting a rebloom on this one anyway. Uh, I did a, t a tiny little planting here of uh, this Carex Feather Falls, which uh, you've seen in a couple other areas of the garden, including in the last shade video, as well as along the uh, skinny front border of the patio. And then I planted that with Dark Side of the Moon Astilbe. Uh, this was, again, I'm just kind of playing around with that Astilbe because I just don't know how much moisture it's going to want to perform well. So I've just been putting it in different areas of the garden to try it out. Another uh, Amsonia in there. Now those Amsonia should grow to be quite large and really fill up a large space. And I do love them for that, for that texture. You can see that I've put in some sunflowers here. This is the Proven Winter Sunflower. And uh, I have not deadheaded, I've not done anything to it. And what a nice, cheery little addition to this garden. There is like right here, you'll see some willow growing up. I do have a few willow plants in here. Eons ago, I planted a whole bunch of willow. Um, my, my goal was to make what they call a fedge along a portion of our property. So this was going to be where I was going to propagate my willow from. Well, that project didn't last too long. I ended up ripping them out, but leaving a few of them. So there are a few willows throughout here. This is uh, Nepeta subsessilis prelude blue. This is a different kind of Nepeta than, than you might be familiar with. But one I highly encourage you to look into. I, I think they're pretty fabulous. Um, I actually divided this one. This is a division from last year. I mean, the flowers are done, but I still think the seed, the flower heads are beautiful. And I like the leaf difference in this from the Napa that, that we're, I think more, most of us are familiar with. Um, and again, this is a nice plant that takes up some room. So uh, you don't need a lot of them to make a big, a big show. Uh, I did put in some, some Gomphocarpus here. So if you know about this plant, you know, and I'm not gonna get into a lot about it, but yes, I put these things by the road because I think it's funny because I'm an 11 year old boy. I did put in some of these bananas. This is, uh, I think this is like a red leaf banana. These were some plants that I got uh, during my big truckload special sale that I found um, and have popped them in. You know, if I had had them in here earlier this year, uh, they would have some real size, which would be really nice. I, we'll see how much size they get this year. I will try to save a few of them because actually I think that leaf texture in this garden is pretty nice.
There's several salvias in here which have pretty much finished blooming. Most of these are, this is all Caradonna, which is a salvia that many people uh, quite like. So this is a beautiful stand of Calamintha Montrose White, and I'm glad you're seeing it now because I think more people should grow this plant. But if you see it at a different time, you might not be as impressed as you should be right now because it is just gorgeous. And let's just see if we can see, you know, there's just bees going nuts in this plant. Now planted throughout here, if you can see these few little stems coming up, are bottle gentian. And that combination, now that's very late to flower, but there should be some flowers still going on this Montrose White. And that combination of the bottle gentian with the Montrose White is pretty spectacular. So I do have some echinacea in here. This is echinacea pallida. I wouldn't say it's exactly doing like anything fabulous here or that it actually did do anything fabulous, but um, I do like that pallida. So we will, we will hold the course on that one and, and hope that goes well. Um, there are other things in here. There's some Caryopteris. This was, again, uh, these were sample plants. And I hope I literally could be killed by the squirrels dropping acorns right now. If I die during this video, you know it was a squirrel that killed me. Uh, this is a Caryopteris with lime green foliage. Uh, no blooms on it this year, but at least so far, but it was quite pretty. There's another look at another Gomphocarpus if you want to be immature with me. Okay, more, another banana here with some of this, um, uh, I think this is Red Rooster Carex. It's very similar to Toffee Twist. Uh, it's one of these brown dead grasses that I think, can you see the stuff falling, you guys? A lot of people think it looks good, I, or it looks dead. I, I think it's great. Um, lots of Liatris blooming through here. This was something I planted all these from bulbs and there were a lot of them. I actually ended up ripping out many of them because there were just too many. And then this is Serendipity Allium, which is done blooming. And I think you can see why Serendipity isn't always my go-to in terms of those alliums. I think some hold their color a little better. So the grass you see here is um, more millennia transparent. It's um, truly transparent, which is what makes it quite nice. And then we've got other interesting plants sort of through here, but, but not a lot happening actually currently with them. Now, I will just show you the Sanguisorba lilac squirrel here. Here's one of the last flowers of lilac squirrel, um, which is just you know, these are the spent flowers, just an outstanding plant. They look like little, well, they look like squirrel tails, I guess. Maybe this, maybe that's why the squirrels are trying to kill me. They just dropped something on me. Um, maybe that's why they're trying to kill me because they think that I've killed a squirrel here or something. Um, so these sedums you see here are just sedums that I transplanted from another garden. I thought they'd fill in nicely. They're nothing special, but I thought they'd do a nice job filling in. And then we cross the creek here. Um, just to show you, I'll zoom in down there. I have planted this bank with a whole bunch of irises. Uh, these are Siberian irises. My hope is that, you know, they like this. Theoretically, that should be a semi-damp place and that they'll be happy there and sort of flourish along, along that bank there because if they don't, other things will. And then here's um, another little phlox, and I think this was a, let's see what this one is, I, I have a tag. And that is from Proven Winners, and it's Luminary Prismatic Pink. Quite pretty. So before we leave this area entirely, I wanted to just show you the other side of the driveway, which I sort of skipped uh, as part of the shade garden. I probably should have included it in that. Uh, this is such a simple area, it almost doesn't even bear sort of a tour, but there are only three plants in here. The grass you see is Hacklencloa macra. It is growing taller and bigger here than it does almost anywhere else. And the only thing I can think of is that it gets a little bit more sun. And so I think it's thriving quite a bit. In fact, you can't even see the address sign anymore, which is good for YouTube and bad for FedEx deliveries. Behind it, we've got some Pagoda Dogwood. This one lost a few branches this year. It was a little unhappy this year, so it's got a far more tiered look. 
Um, it looks like it needs some water right now too. I should probably, I don't know if that one's suffering a little bit or not, but uh, both beautiful trees and um, all of this planted in 2018. Uh, the grasses were, most of them were one gallons that I cut in half. So they were half gallons and planted around. The trees were in probably 10 gallon containers. They were probably four feet tall, if that. And then back here, we've got good old fashioned dwarf Alberta spruce. Um, if I were planting this today, I, instead of using the, um, the Alberta spruces here, I probably would do something like that soft serve camisiparis, just because these Alberta spruces are prone to problems with mites and things like that. And so far we've avoided that, but I, I almost feel like it's just a matter of time before it happens. But we put those evergreens there to provide a little bit more screening um, from the road for us when we sit on the patio. And while the pagoda dogwoods have grown enough now that we don't necessarily need that, uh, it actually makes it kind of a very interesting look from both sides. And then last year, I just started adding in some geranium macrorhizum uh, on the berm here just to fill this in because I figured, why should we look at wood chips when we could look at plants? Okay, so that is the driveway garden. Now we're gonna move just a few steps away to the vegetable garden. And that's where I'm standing right now by my vegetable garden gate that I love so much. Uh, I have a whole video about how I created this garden, things I would do differently in it, the size of it, all the details are there. So rather than cover that stuff here, uh, I will link to that video and you can check that out if you're interested in finding out more about that. But for now, come on in, let's take a look. I do wanna show you what this looks like from outside. Uh, before we go in there because you can see that I've got these two clematis that we'll take a look at once we get in there uh, growing up over this sort of arbor and I sort of love that. Um, I also have these little boxwood balls in front of it. You know my goal with these is to make this into sort of a cloud hedge. Um, I don't pay a lot of attention to these so it's not like they get fertilized a lot or anything so they're not growing super fast but it's a very simple and easy planting to have outside the vegetable garden. So the vegetable garden is way past its peak. I should have filmed this video over a month ago because a lot of things are past their prime. And I'll show you what those are and why I'm letting things stand in a second, but let's turn around and take a look at these clematis. Now, these are out of flower now, uh, but these are two little boss is the name of the clematis. It's a pruning group three, and it's a very hardy clematis, which is great because these grow in containers. These are relatively inexpensive wooden containers that I bought several years ago, and I planted them up, and when I planted them up, I lined them with insulation on all sides in part to protect the wood a little bit because this is pretty cheap wood and I figured they wouldn't last long if soil was touching them and also to add some extra insulation. So these clematis have overwintered here successfully for at least three years now. Originally I had roses planted in these and those did not work out well for me. Um, I will say that I am going to have to do a little bit of work here because the soil level, if you can see this, the soil level has dropped quite a bit over the years. Um, plus, I probably need to refresh the soil in here. So I think what we're going to do is either in fall or spring, probably spring, honestly, I think what I'm going to do is uh, dig these up like, like, I'm like I'm transplanting these dig them out of here, put new soil and replant the clematis right back where they were um, so we can raise that soil level and get some fresh soil uh, in those pots. So I try to rotate my beds every year, but this bed over here tends to usually be some sort of greens because it doesn't get as much sun as some of the others. This is, this is actually borderline full sun here. Primarily uh, from, the, from the east side, we're pretty good. I mean, we do have a very large beech tree there, but the real problem is these trees over here on my neighbor's property across the road, which are continue to grow. 
and ironically they cut down every other tree that they had except for these which are the ones that would have been nice if they had gone away because i'd get more sun in here but we can't control that so we just work with what we have i get enough sun in here for things to do what they need to do so um, i had lots of lettuce here originally you can see i'm letting some of these lettuces go to seed lettuce when it goes to seed is quite pretty but also you can also collect seed which is kind of fun i have beets that should have been harvested about two months ago uh, I always grow kale. Um, this is starting to get fairly eaten up, but it'll get a nice new flush of growth. I'll just go in there and cut out the, the stuff that's been decimated. And we're having a great green bean harvest this year. I love green beans and I try to pick them, you know, every other day or so, uh, cause that one's a little too big. This garden over here is where I had my garlic and my onions, both of which have been harvested and both of which I had the best harvest I've ever had of in terms of size and quantity. And then here I'm growing some leeks. This is called Lincoln leek. I grew these from seed. I've never grown leeks before and you know what? It was easy and they are pretty darn good. I try to plant nasturtium in every bed. Sometimes something else out competes it. Sometimes it does well. I certainly didn't mean to plant enormous varieties of nasturtium here, but that's what you got. This is my squash bed. I lost one of my squashes to squash vine borer, which is super disgusting. Uh, I pulled that sucker out. In fact, I think I have a little video of what that thing looks like when you pull it out of there. It's one of the grosser things you can find in your garden. Uh, those are the cucumbers. They're not looking great, but they taste good. If we can keep those plants alive, we might still get a few more. Some more beans, although these are the little French filet type beans. Uh, I sure do think these are better. They're, they're so tender and small. And this is the problem when I come in the vegetable garden and shoot videos, I tend to eat everything. I'm trying to grow an artichoke. This is um, Imperial Star. It's supposed to be the quickest growing. There is no way I'm getting an artichoke. There's no sign of anything happening this year. So that was an experiment that didn't work. The four beds and the four skinny beds in the middle are my flower beds and you can see we're just on the last vestiges of the sweet peas and what i'm doing is letting the sweet peas i've stopped picking them now and i'm letting them go to seed i keep hearing there's a sweet pea shortage so i figured i better try to save some seed from some of them so um that's what i'm that's what i'm doing so you can see these vines look pretty terrible i'll probably pull them out here as soon as i get a few seeds i don't need a ton um, i'll pull them out and i have not deadheaded this cosmos but this is rubinado cosmos it it's awfully pretty the china asters have been great this year and these last so well in a vase this is one called um uh chamois 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 yellow um this is what they look like when you don't deadhead them um i just kind of plant these beds with the things that i want to cut so there's no rhyme or reason to these beds other than that everything has a sweet pea in the middle this is some of the madame bronze i believe that's Mad madame butterfly bronze with white i think and then over here you know more cosmos um a different snapdragon some fabulous amaranth which is just like the best in bouquets um like i said these beds are way past prime um oh i will show you this though this is scabiosa um and check this is why i'm growing it i am growing it specifically for these amazing seed heads i that is the coolest thing moving down here this bed is sort of embarrassingly unused this year. There was lettuce in it at all, you know, that got pulled out. And then I just never got around to replanting something, which is a cardinal sin, in my opinion. I just I should not have done that. This is a volunteer squash that started coming up and I thought, oh, maybe it'll be a zucchini or something great. Nope, it's like, I don't know what it is, but it's that. I don't even know if that's edible or that's like a, I don't know what that is. This is my herb bed over here. Um, did well this year, certainly. Uh, there's a lot of stuff jammed in here. We've got um, some thyme. We've got um, tarragon. Obviously, the I honestly grow this purple salvia because it's pretty. I don't know that it tastes as good as the other one. 
but it's awfully pretty. This is the little cute boxwood basil. I always like growing those. Huge rosemary plant. I've never grown a rosemary so big in my life. A lot of the basil is pretty much shot. It got really eaten up by Japanese beetles this year, so I should probably either pull that out or cut that off. This one is looking quite good. This is Thai Towers basil. Though That Everleaf Towers series of basil is very, very good. This is the next thing I want to show you. You guys, I'm having an epic pepper year. I've never had such a pepper year. This is Ahi Rico, and it's huge and covered in peppers. And I am growing it. You can see some real nice ones in there. I am growing it specifically because I once had Ahi Rico pepper sauce, hot pepper sauce, and it was the best hot, pe hot sauce I've ever had in my life. So I'm going to try to make some. That's all I know about it. I've never made hot sauce before, but we're going to try to do that. Um, now some of these, let's see, do we have, this is a little jalapeno, which actually I think we got a note from the, a note from the nursery that said, oh yeah, it's not a green jalapeno. It's a like yellow jalapeno. Uh, this was a sample plant. This one's called prism. It's a sweet pepper. This is the size of them. They are delicious, really thick walled and very prolific and speaking. Oh my God, look at this pepper. Look at this pepper. I have never grown a sweet pepper that large in my life. That is one called Turnpike. I've had one off this plant already. I only got two, probably because I'm letting them get so big. The, amazing. I mean, uh, most people won't get so excited about sweet pepper, but I don't have a lot of luck with peppers here because our season tends to be short. And there's a huge one. Let's talk tomatoes because that's about the last thing there is to talk about here. Now, I see that I've had a breach of my of my Florida weave system, which I added something to this year. I, this is how I've been staking my tomatoes for several years. This year I added that cross beam, which helps keep the bamboo canes from bending in. And then what I do is, so we've got just two rows of cross beams, and then I just tie strings and weave them out and just kind of sandwich the plants between them. This is sweet orange too. I was led to believe this was going to be a little sweeter than it is, but it's it's good. It's very good. Um, you can see we've got some that are dealing with disease. This is awesome. Now this is one of my favorite dwarf tomatoes, but it was the first to succumb to some disease. I've got a couple more tomatoes to pick off that, and then that plant is pretty much shot. Um, this guy has been quite prolific, and this is black ver versonage. versonage. Uh, really tasty. I call this sort of a cocktail sized tomato. That's a really good tomato there. I have two Firebird Sweets growing. This is one of them. It's one of my favorite dwarf tomatoes. Uh, it's a little bit stripy. Um, I, I won't I have to say none of my tomatoes have tasted great yet this year, but I find that tomatoes often, the first tomatoes often don't taste good. And we just started harvesting in earnest in the past week and a half. This is Lox and Lad. This is a really nice yellow tomato. Uh, this is, again, this is a dwarf tomato. When I say dwarf, that refers to the size of the plant. And you can see that this one is two and a half feet tall. So nice when you're growing in raised beds not to have tomatoes that get huge. And one of the tomatoes that does get huge, but I grow it anyway, is this one. This is Mexico Midget, by far my favorite cherry. Um, like small cherry. It's so good. It's so sweet. It's prolific. I used to grow it right by the back door because I like to just eat these, um, but it's so big that you can't really contain it. You know, you got to have a real structure to contain it. Mmm, they're so good. This one is not showing off like it was before, but this is one called Pinky Cherry. It's new to me this year. These are the, these are the fruit right here. And this is the size. They are so shiny. They are such a beautiful tomato. Um, I have never seen such a shiny. I mean, it looks like it's been buffed and waxed or something. Gorgeous tomato. Um, they grow on these long, uh, I believe it's a raceme. Now you can see this one is obviously all the tomatoes have come off it, but there were 18 tomatoes growing on this one truss. So. Um, and they're delicious. Very good. So highly recommend that one, but it's not a dwarf. It's a tall tomato. 
This is black for signage again. I like it enough that I planted two. Yeah, we're just starting to see some signs of some issues here in terms of disease, but it hasn't been bad. This little guy is Sun Dipper. Uh, I grew this one last year. These are almost ripe, not quite. Uh, they sort of market this as a tomato that you kind of hang on to and dip. It's a nice little fun cherry tomato. In fact, here's one right here that's pretty, uh, yeah. I mean, they don't get much um, more color than that, so that's pretty ripe there. This is a beauty in here, which is this. Oh, this is a trial one that I got. This is Love Gourmandia Red. Uh, and that'll be my first one off of there. So I'll have to try that one and see what I think about it. I've done several updates this year. Not several, but a few updates on the Espalier Belgian Fence. This is planted with Royal Raindrops Crab Apples. You can see there are a few crab apples on there. They're tiny little fruits. Um, it's doing great. Everything's great. Underneath that, I have planted um, Lobularia which is pretty much the perfect annual for under here. I haven't fertilized these once. I don't pay any attention to them. They just fill in, look great, and they can handle you know, less than full sun, which down here, it's less than full sun. Now, sadly, my I think this is a Bartlett pear, had several fruits on it, and the squirrels took every one of them. It's very sad. They're such yummy pears. I don't know how you deal with the squirrels. I mean, I don't know. Squirrels are like one, like there are things you can do for a lot of critters. I don't know what you do for squirrels who are crawling into your fenced garden. Um, just a word on care about how I deal with these espaliers, which is that, you know, of course there are times when they talk to you about pruning fruit trees. I ignore all of those rules with my espaliers because I'm growing these partially for, oh, here, I'll just talk about this quick because this guy's a little bastard. Uh, this is, um, uh, is this something slug, pear slug, something. And that is what makes these terrible spots on the leaves like this. Uh, they're, they're just disgusting little critters. Um, easily handled with, um, see there's a couple of them on here I should spray. Easily handled with um, A, a big blast of water will take care of them, um, but you have to make sure you do it a couple of times. Or something like Captain Jack dead bug, or, I mean, a, a minor thing. You don't need to go whole hog on these guys. But anyways, what I was saying about pruning these is that I ignore any traditional pruning rules for fruit trees, and I will prune these any time of the year because these are ornamental as well as edible, and they are not attractive when they have these huge, um, when they have these huge stems. And there's no reason for those huge stems to be there because we're trying to keep this neat and tidy. The fruit is produced on fruiting spurs, which is something like this down here. So I'm not trying to create any more fruiting branches here. All of those are just along here. The apple is much better this year than the pear, but I'm hoping I can get through this without the squirrels taking all those because we have a lot on. Um, and they know when they're ripe and they come and get them. In fact, it, we have fewer on than we did before, so they're already starting to grab them. I, I don't know what to do about it, but anyway, good, good apples this year. This is Liberty. It's a very good apple, very disease resistant, very crunchy and delicious. I only got two off this tree last year and they were the best apples I had all year by far. So I'm gonna put some, I'm gonna bag some of the rest of these. Sometimes I think the bags help with the squirrels and sometimes I feel like the squirrels are like, hey, thanks for prepackaging it for me. The last thing I wanna show you is the stock tank pond. I have a video about this too. Now this year, um, normally, so in the past I have ordered lotus. I've, first of all, I have grown water lilies in here. I decided that I prefer lotus because I think it looks better with the height of the leaves over the top of the pond. Um, and I have done a whole video about how I manage this pond and all that kind of thing. So we'll link to that too. But this year, the Lotus tuber that I ordered online did not produce for me. So fortunately that forced me to find a pond store that's semi-local to me. I mean, it's like an hour and a half away, but close enough. 
and they had a great selection of lotus so i bought this one now they didn't know what it was because they didn't they lost they had a flood and lost some labels several years ago and unfortunately it only got three blooms um, which is a bit of a bummer but um you know i do love these lotus pods uh and then i just have a little hmm, this is four leaf water clover or something and then when i was oh and oh i see it fell that's why it's so low this is uh let's see if we can pull that out of there yeah, the problem with ponds is everything's kind of set up on a on a little stand here we go oh there that's better this is a uh, queen tut papyrus now papyrus is really a pond plant or a marginal pond plant so um it's doing just fine just sitting in the water there when i bought that lotus those nice people at the local pond store gave me this canna uh which i don't know if it'll flower again or not but it has half red half yellow flowers and i just want to show you what a canna does when you put it in the water because again water plants look at all those roots growing out the top of that pot isn't that just insane it's wild to me uh, this guy is super tippy and he kind of leans and now i'm never going to be able to get him back in his rightful spot again oh dear sometimes he lays there but what i really want to show you was the fish so in the past i've always just done little feeder fish minnows um, and those have been fine. By the way, I use the fish in the pond to manage, uh, primarily manage mosquito larvae, but also they do clean the LJ in the pond like a touch. This year, um, I still have some of the minnows, but I also picked up about six comet goldfish, small comet goldfish. And then the other change I made is that I have, I have, so you can see them coming. I have started feeding them a little bit. Now, I was always told that you shouldn't feed your fish um, because you want them eating the mosquito larvae and stuff. But what happened when I started feeding the fish is that they stopped being scared of me. So now when I come in here, the fish come out. So that's the vegetable garden. If there's any space in this garden that I'm not happy with the current state of, it's the vegetable garden. But I think everybody's vegetable gardens start looking a little rugged at this time of year. So I just should have shot this video a month ago when everything was looking much fuller and lusher in here. Anyway, it is what it is. This is gardening, and so that's what you get. Okay, so that is it for this series of videos. Thank you for watching them. If you missed any, they're all in the description. Uh, this is a different kind of garden tour where I'm really digging into different plants and conditions, and hopefully it gives you a better feel for my whole garden, which I've never done that kind of tour video before. So thank you for watching. We will catch you in the next one. Have a great day in your garden.